So in this video, we are going to specifically talk about the organization of matter, so elements, compounds, all of that goodness, and then get into an introduction of the two major types of bonds and um, kind of how they behave, similarities and differences between those two. So most of what we've dealt with so far, at least in my class, are elements. They are pure substances made of only one type of atom. So these are all of the things that you find on the periodic table. So we're not reacting anything together. It's just a lump of iron on the table. It's made of only iron atoms. A lump of titanium on the table. It's made of only titanium atoms. When I take two or more atoms and I react them together, I make what's called a compound. A compound is two or more atoms chemically combined to form a new substance. Emphasis here on this chemically combined. So this is not physically combined, but chemically. So we have electrons interacting with each other to form this new substance, and they cannot be separated by physical means. So you can't just uh, boil them away or... My camera's crooked. Use boiling or something like that to separate these two things. They actually have to be uh, some sort of chemical reaction to get them apart. So things like sodium chloride, um, methane, and this is calcium sulfate. So I can't just pull those atoms apart. They are connected to one another by a chemical bond, which we'll get to in a minute. On the flip side, I can mix substances physically, and this physical mixture of substances is called a mixture. Go figure. We've got two different types. We've got heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. So I can use physical means to separate these. I can use um, uh, boiling if it was something like salt water. I could use um, some kind of filtering device. But they are still mixed together, kind of like with a spoon. So a heterogeneous mixture is something that is unevenly mixed. Think chunks and layers. Here, I can write that in. So Italian salad dressing, uh, pizza, Chex Mix, all these things are heterogeneous mixtures because I can see all the bits and pieces. A homogeneous mixture is evenly distributed, evenly mixed throughout the entire mixture. So things like Kool-Aid. Um, the air around you is a mixture. The last thing I want to mention is a solution. And a solution could be called a particular type of homogeneous mixture because it is when one substance is dissolved into another. So salt water, Kool-Aid, where I've taken one thing and actually stirred it, it dissolves into another. Uh, dissolution is actually another topic altogether, but I wanted to just bring in this word, solution in this idea of how we're going to organize uh, matter as we get into this idea of bonding and chemical bonds. So we're going to spend a bit of time focusing on chemical bonds. We've spent a whole lot of time going over atoms and valence electrons and how many they have and all of that nonsense. So now we get to figure out exactly why we did that. A chemical bond is an interaction between valence electrons of two or more atoms through sharing or transferring those electrons, resulting in a compound. So a chemical bond is the means by which I make that compound. I can have two atoms, I can have 15, but it's more than one atom. And I've got two options. I can share the electrons or I can transfer them. But why might they do this, you ask? Why? To obtain a full outer ring. We've spent a lot of time on configurations and a lot of time talking about ions and how many electrons to gain or lose. And the reason atoms bond is to get this full outer ring. Most atoms want eight valence electrons, so that's the S and P electrons on the outermost ring. That's what our valence electrons are, S and P on outermost ring. But we do have some atoms like hydrogen or helium that only want two. <clears throat> now, as I said before, we have two options when we're forming this bond. I can either share my valence electrons or I can transfer them. First, let's talk about the transfer. 
A transfer of electrons occurs. Whoop, somehow my camera's not big enough today. Let's see if I can back that up. Excuse me while I move you. There we go. That's better. An ionic bond is an electrostatic attraction. So electrostatic, just like the static that makes your socks stick together in the dryer, same principle. Electrostatic attraction between a positive and a negative ion. If you remember, a positive ion is called a cation, and a negative is called an anion. So a positive cation is going to lose electrons and a negative anion is going to gain electrons and then the ionic bond is the electrostatic attraction that results from that positive and that negative so you see here I have a transfer of electrons from my cation to my anion for example sodium chloride Let me find me a periodic table Sodium chloride is going to form an ionic bond. If I start off with just a sodium, sodium, I'm going to do the abbreviated configuration here. So sodium looks like neon, and then it keeps going, 3s1. So it has one valence electron on that third ring. Chlorine also looks like neon, 1s2, 2s2. 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. So we have one electron in that third ring. Where chlorine needs one more to complete that outer ring. So this electron right here is actually going to be transferred from my sodium to my chlorine. Since sodium has lost an electron, his configuration now looks like neon. So he has a positive one charge because he has lost one electron. Chlorine's configuration is now 3s2, 3p6, which makes him look like argon. Both of them have eight electrons now in that outermost ring. Chlorine gained an electron, gives him a negative one. So my positive and my negative attract, and this electrostatic attraction gives us our bond. There are some particulars about ionic bonds. They only happen between a metal and a non-metal. If you remember, on the periodic table, this one's kind of beat up, sorry, this zigzaggy line here, Everything to the right of that zigzaggy line is a nonmetal. Everything to the left of that zigzaggy line is a metal. So to make an ionic bond, my substances, my elements have to come from opposite sides of the table. I have a second option, something called a polyatomic. Poly meaning many, atomic meaning atom. So polyatomic is something like uh, ammonia, NH4, and it could be placed with a non-metal, something with a negative charge. I could also do the flip-flop. I could do a metal, something from the left side of the table, and a polyatomic NO3. His name is nitrate. So I do have these ions that are multiple atoms stuck together that do in fact still have charges. We'll get into naming in later subsequent videos, but I just wanted to give you an introduction of the different formats these ionic bonds can take. Some of the properties of ionics are the main two that I want to focus on right now is the fact that this electrostatic attraction is pretty strong. So these melting points tend to be pretty high. For example, sodium chloride. You can't melt salt in a skillet. It's really hard to do. It takes extremely high temperatures to melt sodium chloride. They also form crystalline structures. Uh, salt crystals, uh, you've seen them before, they look kind of squarish, and that crystalline structure is particular to ionic bonds. So that's just a brief introduction, and real quick, before I run out of time on my video, let's talk about covalent bonds. 
Notice that covalent bonds, it's still a bond, so it's still an attraction between two or more atoms, but instead of transferring electrons, I am sharing them. I am not actually giving them up. There are no ions involved. So, my example here is my carbon and my hydrogen reacting together to form this guy. His name is methane. <clears throat> and carbon, if we look at carbon on the periodic table, here it is. Carbon has one, two, three, four valence electrons. I'll draw it like that. Each dot represents a valence electron. And you'll notice that carbon and hydrogen, even though hydrogen's over here on the left side of the periodic table, it's still considered to be a non-metal. So both of these are non-metals. And my carbon and my hydrogen, which has one valence electron, I'm going to need four of those guys. See the four over here? And what's going to happen is that my carbon... And my hydrogens, so I've got four of them, one, two, three, four, there they all are, are going to share electrons. So these two electrons here are going to spend some of their time buzzing around that hydrogen, giving him two valence electrons, which is great. Hydrogen's happy with two valence electrons. The other half of the time, they're going to spend buzzing around that carbon, giving carbon two valence electrons. Same thing with these two guys here. They're going to spend some of their time buzzing around that hydrogen, giving him two valence electrons. Some of their time buzzing around the carbon, giving him two more. Same thing here. Same thing here. So you can see that hydrogen, each of these hydrogens effectively have two valence electrons, and hydrogen's good with just two. This carbon effectively has two, four, six, eight valence electrons, which is the happy thing for him. I have not transferred any electrons. I have not given anybody positives or negative charges. The electrons are just kind of splitting their time between two places. And as I said before, this has to happen between a nonmetal and a nonmetal for this sharing of electrons to happen. Some properties of the covalent bonds, or at least the ones that I want to focus on, are the fact that they have much lower melting points than their ionic cousins. Again, think of uh, sugar, for example, table sugar, just regular old sucrose. You can melt that in a skillet. The melting points aren't near as high. And they tend to form three-dimensional structures that we'll get into later through the repulsion of these electrons. They tend to make, um, one is called tetrahedral, another is called trigonal planar. They're three-dimensional shapes as opposed to the closest crystalline packing that you see in ionic compounds. One last note about covalent bonds. Since we're sharing an electro electrons here between atoms, the atoms don't always share nicely. Believe it or not, we have bullies, even in the atomic world, if I may make the analogy. And that's called polarity. And polarity, think of the word pole whenever you see polarity. And polarity is nothing more than an unequal sharing of electrons within a covalent bond. I've got three options. I can have an ionic bond, which is where I have transferred my electrons. I can have a polar bond where one atom is hogging the electrons. And I have a nonpolar bond where all of my atoms are sharing equally. I have a whole other video discussing polarity more in depth, so I'm going to stop there for now. But I hope this gives you a basic introduction to the types of bonds and some of the ways that matter can be classified. See you next time.